Welcome to the Travel Pulse Podcast. Here's your host, Mark Murphy. Yes, it's your host, Mark Murphy, and I am back with another Travel Pulse Podcast, the intersection of travel, politics, and finance, because guess what? Travel touches virtually all of them. What I want to kick off today with are basically some some news stories, and I think the most recent absurd news story I've, I, I've read is about that tourist, the British tourist, who fell off the cruise ship. Now, I think she was going from Dubrovnik, maybe up to Venice, but whatever. Basically, this lady, quote, fell overboard, and in falling overboard, she proceeded to then tread water for 10 hours while rescue crews searched frantically, and then she was finally discovered fairly near land, and they got her out and... By God's grace, she she survived. Um, based on her stupidity, <laughs> maybe she shouldn't have survived. That would have been called Darwinism. And so with that said, when I saw the story on Travel Pulse, and of course a lot of other outlets carried it, the first thing I thought was people don't just fall off cruise ships. You're not like walking along and thinking about playing some shuffleboard and ah! and over you go doesn't happen. If you've ever been on a cruise ship, you have to try to get off the ship. And lo and behold, 24 hours after this woman credited her yoga training and a few other things for her success in surviving 10 hours in the water and treading water for that period of time, we learned that she had a drunken fight with her boyfriend and literally jumped off the boat. I should say ship. She jumped. So now my question is, why are they not going after her for the expense of, number one, the cruise ship turning around and circling back and trying to find this moron? Secondly, why, you know, is she not paying for all of the other vessels that came to her aid? You know, all kidding aside, I'm I'm glad she survived because, you know, as stupid as it was, you don't want to see somebody die. But at the same time, you know, there's got to be a lesson here, folks, that you, it, you can't have people do these stupid things and then just ba- basically say, oh, you know what? No big deal. You know, everything's fine. She had a fight with her boyfriend. Oh, I'm sure they've reconciled by now because he must have been so concerned. And maybe that was part of her strategy. Maybe that was the come together strategy. Uh, the reunion strategy following the near-death experience. Well, we'll never know unless we interview her, and uh, I don't want to waste my time interviewing her unless you're looking for clickbait. So that's kind of that's kind of interesting. But yeah, that was the big news uh, earlier this week. So I then want to go back a little bit and think about what other news have we heard. Well, several weeks ago, you may have heard about airline CEOs trying quote the cheap seats unquote. The idea is that the airline CEOs would do an interview sitting in a coach seat to emphasize and illustrate why they're so comfortable and, you know, how great their seating is, etc. in coach. That, to be frank, was just dumb. And here's why. If you do an interview for, let's go crazy, a 15-minute interview sitting in a box. You could do that. I could do it locked in a cage. I could do it hanging upside down. Um, That doesn't mean I want to travel to Shanghai 16 hours in a box or a cage. But to illustrate it, the CEOs were making a point. Well, no offense, guys, but my wife's 5'4". Much more comfortable for her to go in a coach seat. On the other hand, I'm 6'2", and I'm not the tallest person on a plane by a long shot. In fact, when I played college basketball, I was the shortest freaking guy on my team. So those big centers and forwards, uh, I, I, I wanted to be them when I was playing ball, but man, today I wish I was 5'8 or 5'10. It'd be a lot easier to go coach. So anyway, with that said, there's a big difference between sitting there for a 15-minute interview and flying even just across the country. So I think that was dumb. I don't think it illustrated anything 
other than some sarcasm from people like me and others on social media and didn't really get the point across. So, so wh- whatever, whatever person or, you know, people on the PR side that thought this was a great idea. Yeah. Uh, freaking stupid. But anyway, now we do have some travel agent news uh, this week. A freaking person posing as a travel agent was taking deposits from unsuspecting travelers who were literally ready to go out on a cruise and the day before they realized they had been scammed. So there are some things you can do to protect yourself uh, as a traveler. And you can go to sites like travelsense.org to find a um, ASTA, American Society of Travel Agents. They just changed their name to Travel Advisors. Uh, but a travel agent is a travel agent advisor, you know, semantics. I know a lot of people in the industry are like, we are advisors. Now, you know what? You, people know you as travel agents. They don't, not, maybe they're not really sure what a travel advisor is. You know, some people want to say travel counselor. Let's just stick to one freaking thing. But anyway, I, I like to call you travel agents because to me, you're a travel agent. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. And for about 60 years before that, I don't think anybody called you anything but a travel agent. But lo and behold, uh, here we are today, travel advisors. But with that said, TravelSense.org offers consumers a directory to find uh, travel agents. And you can see reviews of those agents. People have done business with them. So in a nutshell, don't hand over cash to somebody who claims to be something. Don't <laughs> don't uh, do PayPal because y- there's no recourse. You cannot get your money back, folks. But if you did a credit card, any reputable agent, they don't hold the um, the money. They basically are a pass-through entity. That credit card transaction will take place, let's say, for the Norwegian cruise line sailing you want to take. It'll take place as, as the merchant of record for Norwegian cruise line. So you don't need to give the agent anything. In fact, most agents won't even take a credit card, let alone cash, for a trip because of the issues that just came up. Now, she stole money from these folks. I feel bad, but they should have known better. You don't just do that. Then there are other things you got to think about when booking with a travel agent. Number one, you want to think about, uh, are they accredited? Do they have any kind of designations? Um, If they are uh, recommending certain suppliers, you want to make sure that, again, you pay with a credit card, not with cash or PayPal or anything else that you have no recourse on. If they ask for cash, it's kind of like that guy telling you, uh, yeah, hey, uh, Mark, you uh, you uh, have been designated as a family member and you can go ahead and uh, be eligible for this $10 million inheritance, but all you have to do is give me your bank routing number and your account number and uh, the instructions for wiring and I will wire that $10 million to your account. And then it's signed by uh, Shay. Uh, Akanaso, no, I'm joking, Shay, Shay works for us, but uh, he's Nigerian. So the, the joke obviously is it's somebody in freaking Nigeria because that's where you get a lot of these solicitations from. And uh, as crazy as that sounds, people actually, in some cases, respond to that. Now, on a real estate note, I've been getting calls about a house I sold, gosh, almost three months ago in Fort Lauderdale. We moved up the street. Now, I don't know where they're getting my information from, but I still to this day get calls about the quote house I have listed for sale that is now off the market. Well, hey, real estate agents in South Florida, the house is sold. I'm not going to tell you the address, but the house is sold. So after about 45 phone calls in a 24 hour period, here's how I answered the phone I'd say, hey, it's Mark. And the realtor would say, hi, you know, we're calling about the house that you had listed and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, hey, no problem. Listen, are you in the market to buy a house from me that I don't currently own? Because if you are, all I need is your account number, your routing number, and uh, we can go ahead and make the transaction happen. But keep in mind, I don't own the house. And I started doing this regularly, got a few chuckles and amused myself, which after 45 phone calls, that's the best you can do. Because you just never know who's calling. You got to take the call. What a disruption and what a pain in the ass. But that's what I was dealing with. So again, uh, I pulled the uh, the Nigerian card on this one. And <laughs> uh, I, I don't really want uh, their account number or their routing number. And if anybody tells you that, whether they're based uh, 
in I don't know, pick pick a country. If they're in Bulgaria, if they're in Nigeria, if they're over in Asia, if they're down the street, you don't just give it up, and you don't just give up cash uh, to your quote travel agent who might be an imposter. You want to fact check those people. You want to see if they have reviews. Do they have a website? FYI, um, they can do a lot of things to make themselves look legit. The last thing they can do to be legit is ask you for cash or uh, PayPal because that's not how travel gets booked, just FYI. Now, speaking of uh, pranks, that prank cost people thousands of dollars. Hopefully they'll get it back. On the other hand, the airport prank that has to do with electrical outlets that's driving people batshit. So imagine you're cruising through the airport, you're stressed, your phone's about to die because they always freaking die when you don't want them to die. And instead of buying one of those little Mophie credit card size charger that gets you about a 70, 80% charge, I'm always amused at the people running around with their cords trying to find an outlet. And if you've been to the Philly airport, a lot of those freaking outlets don't even work. I mean, you go and they're totally, totally fine outlet, but you plug it in, there's no juice going to the outlet. So you finally see it. You make your move because it's an open outlet. You get comfortable, you drop your stuff, you settle down, you pull your cables out, you're ready to kick back on that filthy floor, and yeah, you plug it in and nothing. Well, if you thought that was bad, how about you do all those things, sit down, and when you go to plug in, there's no plug there. It's actually a decal. It is a sticker that's being sold on places like Amazon, fake outlets. They even kind of scruff it up to to make it look like it's been used a lot. And they put them in pretty funny places. I've I've seen them on garbage cans in airports. They're certainly on plenty of walls, plenty of posts. And man, people are getting pissed off. Go check it out on Twitter. I don't know what the hashtag is. You'll have to figure it out. But just just search search fake electric outlets, airport electric outlets, fake uh, don't fall. um, Go go, uh, search on Travel Pulse, don't fall for this airport prank. And you'll, you'll see the story and, and what people are talking about on social media. Basically, some people are so mad. They're like, if I see this guy, I'm going to kill him. But um, no one's died yet from a fake outlet. So thank God for that. So anyway, that's what's going on in the world of travel this week. We've covered uh, all of it on Travel Pulse and FYI. You know, a lot of good stuff there. So go ahead and check out Travel Pulse. And even some of those things like the airline CEO trying to uh, cheap seats that you know that story's been out for weeks still funny still awesome to to talk about because it's just been one of those things i'm just like why did they do that and when i read it i was like that's preposterous now weeks later i i can't shake it i I, i'm still shaking my head wondering why the heck they did that but anyway let's move on to politics some people want to know why travel and politics go together and my answer is pretty simple. When you think about, well, let's let's face it. If you're going away on a trip, the last thing you want is the stress and the craziness of what we're seeing 24-7 on these political pundits and these talk shows. I, I literally feel like you cannot escape unless you turn your TV off or just go straight Netflix subscriptions, Hulu, etc., Because every time you turn on a freaking news station, CNN, Fox, you name it, it seems like the only thing they can talk about is politics. Now, if they were talking about politics and travel, all right, man, let's talk about it. But for the love of Pete, if I have to hear one more thing about Russia or Manafort or, you know, uh, Omarosa, for the love of God, I'm – it's like – I'm I'm burned out and I'm in the media business. So I can't imagine the average uh, client out there saying, yeah, I want to learn more about this stuff. It it just, it just boggles the mind. I don't know what the uh, ratings are. I assume they're chasing the ratings. Therefore they feel like they need to keep going with this. But again, other than the quote travel ban that Trump imposed and there's that uproar about it, there's been very little coverage of, politics and travel, etc. But there's a few things to, to point to. Number one, if you look at what's going on with Turkey, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the lira. It went way down. It bounced back, the Turkish lira. 
their currency, which meant that it became a lot cheaper to travel to Turkey. <clears throat> At the same time, because of the politics and the lens of what's happening in terms of the U.S. government putting pressure on Turkey to release that pasture, which is basically what they're doing, it seems that that's the entire motivation, then... You know, we look at that and say, okay, well, all right, if that's the motivation, great. Um, but now that's creating additional problems. Uh, most recently, you know, somebody doing a drive-by shooting at the embassy, uh, the American embassy in Turkey. And thank God no one was injured. But then that gives travelers pause, especially American travelers pause, to go to a place like Istanbul for fear of maybe some retribution. So... Again, politics does factor into travel, and it does in blatant politi uh, political ways, like you just heard, but it also affects travel even when there's nothing controversial going on. And what a lot of people don't realize is how regulated travel is by governments. So just as an idea, I mean, just think about just overall government regulations when it comes to travel. There are regulations with regards to, obviously, the airlines are heavily regulated. Lots of operators on the ground, heavily regulated. If you own a bus company, heavily regulated. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do in travel. There's going to be lots of regulations. Uh, if you've gone into different destinations, obviously, the Customs, Border Patrol, Immigration there is all government-based, uh, of course, because you need to have borders, etc., and entry points. Uh, some countries will impose uh, visas. Uh, it's basically a money-making thing because they want to charge, uh, like, say, in Vietnam, you get a landing visa and you pay for that. You, it's, it's not something you do far in advance. You literally can do it on the plane. And when you get there, you pay the money and, and you come in. It's a way of collecting money uh, from tourists, which is actually a stupid thing for most governments to do. It's penny-wise, pound-foolish because by imposing more taxes and burdens on getting people to travel there, they turn people away and ultimately um, hurt the economic impact that travel brings because travel has a massive impact that's positive for uh, different destinations. And, you know, for instance, just in the U.S., you look at a lot of the, um, a lot of the national and state parks which is a lot of the open space that's out there that's controlled either by the federal government or the local state government. And again, to get into those places, you're, you're going to pay a fee. One of the tips I have for that is you need to make sure that you get an annual national parks card because if you're going to hit a couple of national parks in a year and you've got a few people in your car, kids, your wife, your husband, etc., it's, you're going to save a lot of money. And I've got one and I think it's about 100 bucks a year. It's paid for itself multiple times, literally in the last six months. And I think it comes up again in November. So I'm going to get a lot more use out of it. And I think it's great. But at the same time, you look at politics and travel. And there are some folks out there that are talking about the negative impact uh, where, you know, I mentioned it on the last, last podcast, the one before that, about this whole cultural appropriation, which I think is nonsense. But I read something recently about how tourism is like the new colonialism. So to me, it is so, my dad would say, ass backwards. If you have people going in and spending money in a destination, the writer of this piece I saw wanted it to be perceived as if it was exploitation. And in reality, if you went and I actually spoke to those people there... It's enriching and enhancing their situation, their lives. And it's why a lot of countries and a lot of destinations and many people in those places support heavily uh, the idea of inbound tourism to help their, uh, their people. And to be frank, it doesn't matter if that person's making $2 a day, if that allows them to survive and take care of their family versus $0 a day. You have to look at it and ask yourself, is it a bad thing that we're coming here? Are we really exploiting these people or because travelers are going there? And I'm not talking about U.S. travel. I'm talking about travelers anywhere. Is it actually a positive thing? Case in point, when I traveled to Cuba, think about Cuba. 
years ago, and I'm just speaking from what I've read, because I wasn't there years ago. I was only there two years ago. When I read about travel there, people were truly silenced on the ground. They were not allowed to really interact with American travelers. And because of the embargo, et cetera, it, it was pretty, pretty tight reins. And I was told by folks that I met on the ground that if they were seen speaking to me a couple years earlier, because at the time, two years ago, they were speaking with me openly, that they would have been seen taken down to a local station and interrogated as to what was going on, what was I, what was I there for, what were, you know, what were we talking about, and so on and so forth. And they had, you know, possibility of getting locked up, which is absolutely terrifying. But at the same time, by us going into Cuba as Americans, by us bringing, we're not supposed to, to but, you know, you bring some economic impact and dollars to that destination, uh, you have a positive impact on those people. They see what Americans are really about. That changes the paradigm between what they've been told and what they're actually experiencing. And my takeaway was, wow, these people are so freaking warm and welcoming. It was just phenomenal. So another travel tip is get your ass to Cuba. I mean, it's expensive. Frankly, it's overpriced. Um, you have to jump through a bunch of um, hurdles but you can also find cheaper ways to go by looking at uh, points of entry, you know, let's say, you know, doing what Canadians do. Uh, Canadians uh, traveling from Toronto. You might have to go up to Toronto and come down. Uh, you need to make sure you have things like health insurance and other important things that you need as an American traveling there, obviously visas, etc. But there are ways to do Cuba that aren't crazy expensive. And there are ways to do it that are highly luxurious, like on a small yacht that has a limited number of cabins where you're going to get to explore the island and do it in a very relaxed way. But, you know, don't let the uh, the price point scare you. And certainly the rhetoric, don't let that bother you because it's a fantastic destination and it has some great attributes. But don't expect the Ritz-Carlton. I mean, you are not going to get anything close to you know, the the types of hotels, resorts, and services that you've grown accustomed to if you're a traveler in the U.S. or Europe or Asia or most other places because the level is just not there and it's going to take some time. But that's also what makes it charming. It also is what makes it different. And, you know, everyone was afraid of it, cool, getting Americanized. That hasn't happened and that's not going to happen. It's a unique destination. It will remain unique and you know, for the time being, there's not a um, a lot going on in terms of the investment taking place to really transform the destination. I think that's a that's actually a good thing, and for some of the people there, not such a good thing. Uh, but it is uh, it is the way it is, and obviously, when it comes to Cuba politics, you know, are at the forefront of that destination and what's going on. So. These are some of the things that have happened this week uh, in travel and some musings on just the, the, the politics of travel and, and such. So until next week, uh, I hope you all have a great one. I hope you do get out there and travel. And remember, this fall is going to be one of the best opportunities for you to get out and explore and do it because uh, the values are unbelievable and you should take advantage of them if you've got the ability to get away between now and and let's say uh, the third week of, of November when Thanksgiving kicks in. Until the next time, I'm Mark Murphy. Thanks for listening and tuning in.